Good evening. I'm Warren Finch, the Acting Director of the John F. Kennedy Presidential Library Museum. And on behalf of my library and foundation colleagues, I thank you for coming this evening. I'm so delighted to welcome you. And I'm also delighted to welcome all of those who are watching tonight's program online. I'd like to acknowledge the generous support of our underwriters, the Kennedy Library Forums, lead sponsor, Bank of America, the Lowell Institute, and our media sponsors, the Boston Globe, Xfinity, and WBUR. I would also like to thank, the, to thank the support of the National Archives Foundation for tonight's program. We are so pleased that Jim Dumas, Deputy Executive Director of the National Archives Foundation, is here with us this evening. Tonight's forum is featured in the National Archives Remembering Vietnam Initiative. Remembering Vietnam is presented in part by the Lawrence F. O'Brien family, the Pritzker Military Museum and Library, AARP, and the National Archives Foundation. We look forward to a robust question and answer period following the discussion. And when Q&A starts, we invite you to proceed to the microphones in the aisles to ask your questions. Lawrence O'Donnell has kindly agreed to sign copies of his most recent book after tonight's program. Our bookstore has copies available for purchase if you are interested. The 10th Archivist of the United States, David Ferriero, had planned jo on joining us this evening, but unfortunately the weather in Washington, D.C. prevented his travel here today. A Navy corpsman himself, he has been integral to the National Archives exploration of the conflict and its legacy through the Remembering Vietnam Initiative, and I'm pleased to share a few of his thoughts on tonight's program now. More than 50 years after the United States committed combat troops to the war in Vietnam, and more than 40 years since the war ended, the complexity of the conflict is still unraveling. Historians continue to make discoveries in the National Archives records that provide insight into this critical period. We believe it is critical to continue to examine the issues presented by the war, and discussions like tonight play a critical role in deepening our understanding of the period. Reflecting on new scholarship about the war, the National Archives undertook its newest exhibition, Remembering Vietnam, 12 Critical Episodes in the Vietnam War, with the goal of fostering continued discussion among those who lived during the time period, as well as new generations. The exhibit examines 12 critical episodes in the Vietnam War to provide a framework of understanding the decisions that led to the war, events and consequences of the war, and its legacy. This 3,000 square foot exhibit uses more than 80 original records from the National Archives, including many declassified documents, to critically re-examine major events and turning points in the war. We have also developed a Vietnam War research portal on the National Archives website that creates a central space for all National Archives resources and content related to the Vietnam War for use by researchers, students and educators, museum goers, veterans, and those who are curious about the conflict. Now I ask all Vietnam veterans of any United, or any United States veterans who served on active duty in the United States Armed Forces at any time during the period of November the 1st, 1955 to May 15th, 1975 to stand and be recognized. Veterans, as you exit Smith Hall after tonight's program, library staff and volunteers will present each of you with the Vietnam veteran lapel pin. On the back of the pin is embossed, a grateful nation thanks and honors you. The United States of America Vietnam Commemoration is a national initiative and the lapel pin is the nation's lasting memento of thanks. 1968 was a pivotal year in the history of the conflict for so many reasons. The Tet Offensive and the presidential election key among them. 
Now to examine some of the events of that year in more detail, I am delighted to introduce the panel, the participants in tonight's discussion. We are so pleased to welcome Lawrence O'Donnell, author of Playing With Fire, the 1968 Election and the Transformation of American Politics, and host of MSNBC's The Last Word with Lawrence O'Donnell. We are also honored to welcome Frederick Logoville, Professor of History and International Affairs at Harvard and Pulitzer Prize winning author of The Embers of War, The Fall of an Empire and the Making of America's Vietnam War. He is also working on a biography of JFK. Chris Oppie, professor of history at UMass Amherst and author of American Reckoning, the Vietnam War, and Our National Identity. It is also a pleasure to welcome back to the library Ellen Fitzpatrick, professor of history at the University of New Hampshire, to moderate tonight's discussion. Thank you all. Okay, there's a lot to talk about. Uh, I want to begin, since we're here at the Kennedy Library, by asking Fred, uh, who is an expert on uh, the history of the war in Vietnam and has written two really outstanding books on the subject uh, that I teach to my graduate students. Um, and so I'm very delighted to have the chance to ask you these questions directly on behalf of our audience. Uh, but since we're here at the Kennedy Library, I wanted you to uh, say a few words to provide some context to where the war was in 1968. Uh, and the forces that had led to a massive escalation of the war by that point in time when nearly 500,000 US military personnel uh, were there in South Vietnam. How did we get from Kennedy's 16,000 advisors in November of 1963 or thereabouts to the full-scale war that Lyndon Johnson was overseeing uh, by 1968? It's a complex story, and I don't expect you to tell it in a few minutes. But I wondered if you could talk about what you see as the two or three greatest factors that led to the widening of the war from Kennedy's time to LBJ's? Sure. Well, you know, I'm, I'm one of those people who believes that the transition from, from John F. Kennedy to Lyndon Johnson actually matters. So that particular what if, that particular counterfactual seems to me has <laughs> historical importance because I do believe that a surviving Kennedy would have approached the prospect of an escalated war differently than Johnson did. But Johnson is who we have as president, who becomes president when, when JFK is killed. I think Lyndon Johnson, for a complex set of reasons, which we won't go into here, decides, though, that, though I do think they have a great deal to do with his perceived domestic political imperatives and his own sense of his own place, if I can put it that way, in history, decides when push comes to shove, which is really in the early months of 1965, that he's got to Americanize this war. I think what's important for us tonight here, talking about 68, and I have a, I have a piece in the New York Times this coming weekend which talks about this in the context of his resignation speech, March 31st, 1968. I shall not seek, I will not accept the nomination of my party for another term as your president. That's coming up, as we all know, in just a few days, March 31st. So in this piece, I suggest that what's remarkable about Johnson in 19, with respect to 68 is that he knew this was going to happen. He said to Lady Bird, his wife, he said to other associates in 63, late 63, in 64, and in 65, in effect, Vietnam is going to be the end of me. I'm trapped. I have nowhere I can go on this war. And so it was as though he had a sense 
that what happened to him in 1968, in fact, would happen. That's, it seems to me, what's so tragic about this story. I also believe that Lyndon Johnson, at the beginning, doubted both that the war was winnable, even with American ground troops, even with massive American air power, and doubted that the outcome really mattered to American security. So it's a difficult story, Ellen, it seems to me, to talk about. Um, but it seems to me that what we have in 68, as you pointed out, we have an, a, an escalated war by both sides. Hanoi matches America's, each of the American escalations is matched by Hanoi. You have a stalemated war, a war that is not going well. Westmoreland comes back in late 67 and basically on Johnson's orders says, there's light at the end of the tunnel. My fellow Americans, we're going to make this thing work. And then Tet happens. So maybe I'll stop there and simply suggest that um, it's a stalemated war at the beginning of 68. It's a war that Lyndon Johnson, I think, understood was going to reach this point, was going to threaten his beloved Great Society legislation. And it's, in fact, what turned out. I'm not going to let you totally off the hook, because I want to go back to your counterfactual, which you raise in your book, Choosing War, with the provocative question, what if Oswald had missed? <laughs> and uh, you suggest that Kennedy was not likely to follow Johnson's course. However, as Lawrence points out in his book, his brother, Robert Kennedy, with whom he shared so much, mm -hmm. uh, only slowly broke with LBJ over the war. So I'm wondering if you have any thoughts and whether your recent research that you've been doing here uh, about the difference between the two Kennedy brothers mm -hmm. in this early phase of things. Uh, has anything become clarified for you? Have you changed your thinking at all about this? I don't think I've changed my thinking about this. This part of the book of the biography I haven't yet written. But I think that um, my view still holds, which is, of course, that we can't know because this is a, a what if. We can't know what a surviving Kennedy would have done. But for me, the best argument is still that if John F. Kennedy returns from Dallas alive, um, I think he would have kept things percolating through the 64 election. I don't think he would have wanted to do anything to, to, to either escalate the war in 64 or to withdraw in 64 because the smart political strategy was to, to keep the thing going. But I think that he would have been far more likely than Lyndon Johnson for reasons that I lay out, having to do with his reading of history, having to do with the way he used his advisors, having to do with the fact that for him, the key decision on Vietnam would have come in his second and final term when he could no longer run for re-election. Matters enormously. And then I would say that I think he and his brother saw this a little differently, even in 62 and 63. I think Bobby, Bobby was more hawkish. I think in the missile crisis, um, uh, Jack, was really the only one in the room on the XCOM who uh, was totally committed to seeking a political solution to the missile crisis question. But even on Indochina, it seems to me that there is some daylight between the two brothers. Now, last thing I'll say is, of course, that a surviving JFK, would, it would have been, I'm not wanting to say here that it would have been easy for him, especially in domestic political terms, to withdraw from the war. But I think he ultimately would have if the alternative is massive escalation. It's interesting that one thing you mentioned in the book that you didn't mention just now is that uh, JFK's own experience of war you saw as a variable in this as well. And of that's course, that's mm -hmm. something that his brother, Robert, did not have. Mm -hmm. uh, he had not seen the kind of action or action at all in the Second World War that John F. Kennedy had nor had Lyndon Johnson. And there's nothing like an up-close encounter with war to, uh, to de-romanticize warfare. Which leads me to you, uh, Lawrence. In your, uh, your book, you begin, I think, uh, very powerfully uh, talking about uh, the stakes in this election and uh, in 1968 and really uh, what mattered. Uh, and you use this wonderful phrase when you say uh, 
that life was a short-term gain for young men in 1968, and that was what was really at stake in that year was the life and death of people we knew. And I wondered if you could talk a bit about that element of the story. Yeah, so the, the war backdrop that I think we should all have in mind uh, as we think about 68, uh, there's a present, present day statistic that you should have in mind. And that is that in all of America's 21st century war making, in all of it, Afghanistan, Iraq, all of it, 6,500 Americans have been killed, 6,500. That was basically the summer of 1968 in Vietnam. In Vietnam, in 1968 alone, in one year alone, 16,589. So just, just imagine what the feeling would be in this country if we'd had a year like that in Iraq or Afghanistan. Uh, and the big difference, of course, in 21st century war making is everyone has volunteered uh, to, be, to be in the military. In 1968, 18-year-olds, uh, 19-year-olds had these draft cards in their pockets that could end their lives. It could certainly uh, control what they were going to do for the next couple of years. And that was a fear. That was a constant fear for most people. Uh, who were exposed to it, because the thing you have to, one thing you got to remember, and this often gets lost, and I know all the, the veterans here know it, but in American war making, there is a really tiny piece of the population that ever hears a shot fired. In American war making, it is a minority of the military that actually gets exposed to combat. And so uh, the, the idea that we were sending 500,000 over time uh, into this combat zone in a place that they didn't know existed a couple of years before was just a, a, a really peculiar and tense uh, and difficult social fabric to, to be in the middle of. And so, uh, they, you know, the protests all grew out of that. But it's, it's, this, it's this stunning amount of involuntary death that is taking place for a cause that no one can explain. No one has a sentence that works for why we're doing this. It's not World War II. People didn't need an explanation. People knew what the explanation was. Uh, and so that was a peculiar uh, thing that this society had never experienced before. Uh, and that whole question of why are we at war was a slow one to form in the heads of everyone in the 1960s, including Robert Kennedy, who I now look at uh, as really just another guy living through the 1960s. There was not one person his age who thought the same thing in 1963 that he thought in 1969 about anything, never mind Vietnam. Uh, and so, uh, the speed with which people came to these different realizations in politics, Gene McCarthy being ahead of Bobby Kennedy, others being ahead of Gene McCarthy, uh, that all makes sense when you kind of step back and, and look at it and understand that it's the first time in any of their lives that they are formulating any kind of anti-war sentiment against an American war policy. It had never been it never crossed through their minds, ever. McCarthy, none of them had ever thought of this. And so uh, you can allow people a little time in, in coming into an entirely new uh, area of thinking. And, it's, and then when, you're, when you throw politics on top of it, politicians are afraid. They wake up in the morning afraid. They are afraid of the other party. They are afraid of what the other side is going to do to them. And, um, you know, one of the great things about JFK's book title, Profiles and Courage, is that in politics, it's the other quality that defines most of what happens. And I would submit that's the biggest, the single biggest difference between LBJ and JFK is the degree to which LBJ was afraid 
of virtually everything around him in politics, afraid of what Barry Goldwater was going to say about him, afraid of what Richard Nixon was going to say about him, afraid of that right side, afraid of what the New York intellectuals were going to say about him. He was afraid of everything that he saw. Uh, and, and JFK had much more confidence about a bunch of those things, and I think a bit more political bravery about some of those things. Um, and so the, the, the condition of the country in 1968 was a condition it had never been in before. And since Vietnam, we have not been in that kind of condition again. And I know a lot of 20-somethings uh, in the early 21st century thought this was the worst thing we'd ever seen, that we were engaged in this far-off war that didn't make sense to them. And they thought George W. Bush was the worst thing they'd ever seen in the White House and the most insensitive person prosecuting a war against the, the, uh, without the support of those, the, those people who were against it. Uh, but that, when you think about the turmoil of that, when you think about the protests that we uh, saw and heard uh, in, say, 2005, 2006, 2007, that, that, was, that was just nothing. That was just the tip uh, of the iceberg of what every day of 1968 was. Your, your quote reminds me of uh, Eleanor Roosevelt's criticism, even of JFK, that he should show less profile and more courage. <laughs> this was, uh, <laughs> but you know, you can say that yeah, I, I could measure every politician I, I've ever seen or observed or observed historically. In, I can describe them in, by how much courage they had or how much cowardice they had. And, and the cowardice is, a, is an understandable tactical position that you have. It's a fear of the enemy and a fear of what the other side will do right. politically. It's an understandable condition to have. Which they clearly all had in 68 in abundance, as you demonstrate. Chris, this brings us to your book, and the, you begin American Reckoning, talking about the Vietnam, uh, the American soldiers in Vietnam, who very much resembled what Lawrence was just saying, which is that uh, their conception of going to this war uh, was framed in a context that uh, was unlike the way we have viewed wars since Vietnam. Could you say a little bit about that? Um, Sure. I mean, this, if we take the decade as a whole, which was a decade full of crises, but 68 had such critical mass, there must have been a dozen events that uh, would, in a typical year, have dominated the headlines for months, some of which we've long forgotten. Mm -hmm. I mean, just briefly, for example, uh, North Korea, since that's very much on our mind, captured an American spy ship and held captive some 83 American sailors for the, almost the entire year. And that kind of fell out of the newspapers, although LBJ was continued to be concerned about it and parenthetically actually handled that, that issue very well by contrast with the war and some other things. But um, within the larger context, one of the extraordinary things that I'm sure many of you remember is that the beginning of the decade, was a time of extraordinary um, idealism, stimulated, of course, by President Kennedy, but by all kinds of sources, the civil rights movement, uh, of course, and an emergent uh, uh, youth movement and, and youth culture. I mean, you know, even the space program uh, contributed to that sort of sense of uh, unity mm -hmm. and idealism and the possibility that ordinary people could change things and that nonviolent activism could change things and that the government itself could be an agent of change. There was still through the mid 60s very broad support uh, in the government to do the right thing. And um, you know that really collapses and 1968 is a key turning moment in, in, in bringing uh, a new level of, of, uh, of doubt and uh, demoralization and uh, intense division and a, a real loss of the sense of idealistic unity so that by the end of the decade, and one of the legacies that I'm sure we'll get to, it is a, a sense that um, you know, peaceful uh, mainstream politics r really can't maybe ever change the country in a positive direction. I think, if I may, just, yeah. just to piggyback, I think that you sense some of what Chris is talking about in Johnson's resignation speech. So again, it's coming, a 50th anniversary is in just a few days. I think you can sense in there that he perceives 
that his beloved domestic legislation and the idealism that Chris referred to, that is at the heart at the, or sort of at the roots of the Great Society legislation is now under threat because of the war. So Johnson himself in that moment, and he prepares two versions of the speech, one which includes his, his announcement that he won't seek uh, the nomination of his party and one which doesn't. So he's, he's not certain right up to the end what he's going to do. But the point is, I think what Chris has described, not only did we see, can we see in hindsight that 68 marked a change, there were people, including the president, who was no dummy, who could see that in fact, because in large part, not exclusively, but in large part because of his war decisions, and in, in particular making this a large-scale American war, this was now under threat. It occurs to me that we think so much about the framing of uh, American involvement in uh, Vietnam through the lens of the Cold War and the Cold War ideology that shaped our intervention. But the frame of reference for warfare itself was really the Second World War and the experience of uh, the fathers of some of the men who would go to Vietnam in that war. And uh, when Kennedy was elected, it was only 15 years mm -hmm. since the end of World War II. And this had been, of course, a great victory for the Allies and the United States central role in that. So the concept of warfare itself uh, evolves and changes through this, this particular war, which brings us, I think, to the Tet Offensive, which was the inauspicious start to 1968. And uh, Tet is widely seen as the turning point in uh, American opinion towards the war. But the story is more complicated than that. Lawrence, do you want to say a word or two about it? Well, you could argue tactically that the, the United States military succeeded uh, in the Tet Offensive, but it didn't look that way on TV. And that's when we discovered, and that's when American politics discovered, uh, that now that we do televise wars, the way the war plays on TV is what's going to matter most. Uh, and so the, it, it was experienced in the United States as two things. As, first of all, um, the, the revelation of some kind of lying on the part of the American military who were, kind of, who were giving us the impression that this was impossible, uh, that the North Vietnamese forces could not mount any, any kind of threatening offensive, uh, and, and then that the, the cost of this was too high, that whatever uh, we were fighting about over there uh, this body count is too high. And uh, the, the problem that would continue for Lyndon Johnson, and it's really summarizable in, in a sentence, is it's just that he could, not, he could not allow himself to be the first American president who lost a war. And so, so he could know that this isn't going well. He could know that these generals who've told, given him a certain optimistic read uh, have given him optimistic reads before that aren't true, uh, and he could have the political instincts to understand how this will play, how this war is playing negatively uh, in, in the country, but he was trapped. He was trapped in that spot that he didn't want in history as uh, the first president who would lose a war. So his continued commitment to it was always not so much a commitment to win, but a commitment to punish through, you know, through the art of war, to punish the North Vietnamese to the point where they would negotiate some kind of thing that Lyndon Johnson could say was not defeat for the United States. Um, and then he ended up being followed by Nixon, who was guided by the same principle. It couldn't, couldn't be the first president to lose a war. What other than Tet drove Johnson out of the race. We had the beginning of the McCarthy campaign, the anti-war movement, the New Hampshire primary. If you had to prioritize these factors, what do you think was most salient? Well, March 12th, Gene McCarthy wins the New Hampshire primary, which well, I, I thought he won, because uh, I was a high school kid watching it on TV here in Dorchester. And uh, 
He did, he did so well that it felt like he won. He came in second uh, to Lyndon Johnson, which I didn't know for decades. And uh, so, but you know, he's perceived to have won. Uh, March, four days later, uh, March 16th, Bobby Kennedy announces his candidacy. So now, uh, Lyndon Johnson has Gene McCarthy running against him, which was a certain, which seemed to be no problem until the votes were counted in New Hampshire. Then he has Bobby Kennedy running against him uh, by March 16th, by that Saturday after the Tuesday New Hampshire primary. And then March 31st, Lyndon Johnson says, I'm not running for re-election. Uh, it's, it's inconceivable to me that there is anything that could have happened in Vietnam that would have gotten Lyndon Johnson to make that announcement. I understand that he made it at the end of a speech that was in the works for weeks about Vietnam, uh, but if he had crushed Gene McCarthy in New Hampshire, if Gene McCarthy had gotten three, four percent of the vote, if Bobby Kennedy didn't get in the race, I don't believe March 31st would have been Lyndon Johnson announcing he wasn't gonna run. Brad, you look like you're poised to comment. <laughs> I'm as calm as can be. So I, I, I guess I see it just a little bit differently. I think that, I think you're quite correct that if those things don't happen, if McCarthy doesn't perform as well as he does, if RFK doesn't get into the race, I agree with you. But they do. I mean, if, if, so if you're asking me, Ellen, asking us to rank order or at least talk about why he makes the choice that he makes on March 31st, and maybe, maybe Lawrence and I, in a sense, don't disagree, we're just looking at it, the question differently. But I would say, for me, at the top of that causal hierarchy is the war. I think it's the war, ultimately, that is key to his decision. And that's connected, obviously, to what happens in, in these primaries. So the war, I think he has concerns about his own health that are legitimate. He's not sure he'll live four years. Uh, his poll numbers are going down. Again, largely, it seems to me, because of the war. And then he sees the threat that these other Democrats represent to him. But I would still, I don't know whether you agree, Chris, but I would put, I would put the war at the top. Well, they're interconnected. I, I, let me say something more contextual, which Lawrence began to say. There had been this enormous propaganda, a quite successful propaganda campaign throughout 1967. Especially in the fall. Yeah. Especially in the fall to convince the American public that things were really going well, that we were winning the war, that the, the enemy was uh, tiring and demoralized and its, uh, and its numbers declining. And um, so that the, the fact that uh, communist forces could pull off this massive, uh, largely, uh, a surprise to most Americans anyway, uh, a, a nationwide uh, attack, uh, and to bring the war into the city centers and bases where they had never gone before, even the, the grounds of the American embassy, was enormously shocking. I mean, the point was you'd, that we've been told that we're winning the war, and now we're, we're fighting all over the place, and I think the, pol the, politi the anti-war Politicians capitalized on this brilliantly. I mean, McCarthy said, you know, we've been told that uh, uh, we had secured 65% uh, of South Vietnam, and now we can't even secure our own embassy. Or, or uh, you know, in his stump speech, RFK, the, the, from the first speech and on, he capitalized on a line that came out of the Tet Offensive, which I'm sure many of you remember, which is the devastating way in which the United States militarily anyway, successfully launched a, a brutal counteroffensive to drive communist forces back out of the urban areas through lots of shelling and bombing, and much of it very indiscriminate with lots of civilian casualties. There was uh, uh, a town in the Delta called Bentre where uh, roughly a thousand, almost a thousand civilians were killed by the American bombing, and an American journalist asked the major, what, ha what happened here? I just see you know, stacks of bodies. And the major said, this is the line you'll remember, it became necessary to destroy the town in order to save it, which you know, completely reveals the sort of contradictory aspects of the war. And RFK in his speech said, well, if it becomes necessary to destroy all of South Vietnam, will we do it? And if we will, why do we get into the war in, in the first place? And it became a kind of a, you know, a metaphor of, all the, of what was so hypocritical about uh, American involvement. I, I also think that uh, Walter Cronkite's extraordinary sign-off, is that the term we use? Mm -hmm. But on February 28th, when he talks about how the only conclusion we can reach is that we're in a stalemate, and he calls for negotiations, and he says, we're, it, it, you know, negotiations by an honorable people who did the best they could. 
It seems to me that is, for, for a lot of Americans around the country, for whom Walter Cronkite is, is, is second to God, that's a very, very important <laughs> moment in this. I do think there's a way, however, that the Tet Offensive, we can exaggerate the importance of the Tet Offensive. There's a different way of looking at it, which is to say that it doesn't change as much as you think. And here I don't only mean that the war continues for another five years. It's also the, it's also the case that even before the Tet Offensive, at the highest levels of government, there's, there's deepening pessimism, not, yeah. notwithstanding the propaganda yeah. campaign. Yeah. That's happening in 67. It's also the case that after Tet, both the Americans and the North Vietnamese wage furious war. And there's the fact that in 69, 1969, the year after, um, as many Americans die in Vietnam as died in 1967. So we should be a little bit careful about saying that Tet changed Everything. Well, along these lines, to think about the political distance that we've traveled, uh, I won't say progress that has been made since 1968, uh, consider the fact that Gene McCarthy was really running a single issue campaign around uh, his opposition to the war in Vietnam. American troops are in harm's way. The president is insisting that the war effort requires our full commitment, and yet this anti-war candidate is gaining traction, and gaining traction far beyond just the students that are clean for Gene and up in New Hampshire knocking on doors and ringing doorbells. And so uh, when you think about that scenario of having a sitting president being challenged by someone within his own party with a full bore commitment on the part of this country, like it or not, being that vulnerable, clearly other things are at work other than the Tet Offensive or uh, McCarthy himself as a candidate. And you, uh, Lawrence, in your book, talk about the uh, underpinnings of this Dump Johnson movement and Allard Lowenstein mm -hmm. and his role in really uh, sort of spurring this grassroots activism. I wondered if you could comment on that as a factor in all of this. Well, that was all about Vietnam. There would have been no Dump Johnson movement if there were no Vietnam War, and all of domestic politics played the same way. All the same things happened in domestic politics. So that was entirely based on, on the, the war. And Alan Lorenstein was the guy who got Gene McCarthy to run. He was running around for a couple of years, well, starting in 1967 and very busily uh, looking for a candidate uh, to be the Dump Johnson candidate because Lowenstein, who was this gadfly liberal uh, around democratic politics who everyone knew, strangely, everyone from Eleanor Roosevelt to Bobby Kennedy uh, to local Republican congressmen in strange places. He was friends with Don Rumsfeld, Eleanor Roosevelt, and Bobby Kennedy at the same time. So there's one of those. And, uh, and so he, uh, he wanted to get the Vietnam War on the ballot, on the presidential ballot, in the Democratic primaries, and he needed a candidate to do that. And so the first place he went was Bobby Kennedy. And he tried to get Bobby Kennedy to do it, and Bobby Kennedy broke his heart and, and thought about it for a minute and said no. Uh, Al Lowenstein kept going back to Bobby Kennedy, and Bobby actually started to think about it a little bit, and then each time he would say no, each time he would think about it a little bit more, he'd be slower in saying no. Uh, meanwhile, Gene McCarthy is sitting there in 1967 in uh, the Senate Foreign Relations Committee listening to this testimony about how things are going in Vietnam. And he has an undersecretary of state, Nicholas Katzenbach, in the middle of his testimony at one point say that he thinks Katzenbach and the State Department believe that declarations of war are outmoded. Uh, and this enrages uh, Bill Fulbright, who's the chairman of the committee, Gene McCarthy, who's a member of the committee, uh, who believe that these, the constitutional separation of powers on war making is important, and they don't believe declarations of war are outmoded. And McCarthy does an interesting thing that I, that I, I understand from my days of uh, working on Senate committees on the staff, is that he doesn't actually get in a public fight with Katzenbach in the room. McCarthy is so livid when he hears this 
that he gets up and leaves uh, because he doesn't really trust the way he would handle himself in an, in an angry public fight about it. But when he steps out of the, the, uh, that committee room that you see uh, on TV, there's a, right on the other side of that door, there's a conference room that all the committee rooms, ha all the committee hearing rooms have. And it's in that room that he says to his chief of staff with a New York Times reporter present, it's off the record, but he, he says, we have to get this war on the ballot, and if I have to run myself to do it, I will. And that's after Lowenstein has been trying to get him. Uh, and eventually, you know, uh, Bobby really does break Al Lowenstein's heart and says no convincingly. Lowenstein gives up on Bobby. Uh, and then it gets kind of funny, you know, because he would go to McCarthy, and McCarthy would say, uh, you should talk to Kennedy. And he'd say, well, I talked to Kennedy. And, and, and McCarthy would say, well, talk to George McGovern. And he'd go, Lowenstein would go talk to George McGovern. McGovern would say, you should talk to Gene McCarthy. And, uh, and so that's how you ended up with Gene McCarthy. And uh, Lowenstein couldn't quite believe it uh, when McCarthy uh, finally said yes uh, toward in the fall of 1967, announcing uh, at the end of November of 1967, and it was the most modest announcement you could imagine. He didn't really even say he was running for president. He just said he was going to, he was going to be on the ballot in uh, a few <laughs> states. He hadn't even decided he was going to run in New Hampshire, and he would not mention Lyndon Johnson's name. He wouldn't say, I'm running against Lyndon Johnson. Uh, Bobby's campaign announcement was similarly modest in its way and not personal and not you know, targeted in any way at Lyndon Johnson. Uh, and that's because both of them were embarking on something that they found inconceivable, which was challenging the incumbent president of their own party for the nomination. And it wasn't just any incumbent president. It was the most masterful politician at the nitty gritty of politics who had ever been sitting in that Oval Office. Uh, he made JFK look naive uh, about politics uh, compared to Lyndon Johnson. And so they were, they were choosing to challenge the most fearsome possible incumbent they could challenge, but just the very principle of it. Gene McCarthy, was at, he actually came in second in 1964 in Lyndon Johnson's search for a vice presidential candidate to put on the ticket with him. It was, he was going to pick Humphrey or Gene McCarthy. And uh, Gene McCarthy uh, didn't get it, Humphrey did. But that's how close McCarthy had been with Lyndon Johnson. Uh, so it was a, at a personal level, what, they, what each of them were doing, what Bobby was doing, what Gene was doing, was something they both found inconceivable just months earlier. Just months earlier, you couldn't have gotten either one of them to, to, to agree to do it. So Johnson's withdrawal from uh, the race and his speech in which he announces at the same time at the end of March of 1968 this halt to the bombing um, was widely seen as a victory for the anti-war forces. We know the celebration was premature, to say the very least. Why didn't Johnson's exit from this uh, in your view, turn the tide within the Democratic Party. I mean, we can point to the assassination of Robert Kennedy in June, of course, um, but there's a moment of exhilaration, and yet we know that the outcome is uh, that Humphrey is nominated in, in uh, the summertime, and leaving aside for a moment the general election that follows with Nixon, what, was, what within the Democratic Party happens at that point, in your view? Uh, there's obviously the tension between uh, the Robert Kennedy and uh, McCarthy forces who are split between yeah, well, the two. The, 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 it's unclear because it turned out to be such a mess. It, it is, and, and there were two candidates that were peace candidates, or anti-war candidates. Um, it's, it's unclear exactly how big the anti-war vote was, even within the Democratic Party, because you have to remember, most states did not have primaries. Uh, and so you didn't get a clear voter expression about this around the country. Certainly within the establishment of the party, the delegates who choose the nominee at the convention, uh, they went with Hubert Humphrey because uh, they were going with the 
most, most importantly because they were going with the establishment candidate because that's what they do. That's kind of what their, their job is. And Humphrey was able to get the nomination without running in a single primary. That's how unimportant the primaries were and incomplete as a nominating force. Uh, but, but Johnson uh, was left uh, kind of politically adrift after March 31st because he, he suddenly, uh, what, the idea and the idea expressed in the speech was now I'll be able to devote myself entirely to the pursuit of peace, to the pursuit of a solution here and I, can, I don't have to be bothered by uh, campaigning, but that was like cutting off an LBJ leg. You know, campaigning was was the the way he made all of his calculations. Uh, he also discovered uh, what uh, lame duck presidents discover is that people don't listen to them. They do not listen to them though the way they were listening to them five minutes ago when he was possibly going to be president for another four years. Uh, and and he still was wrestling with how do you do this. How do you negotiate with these people who he does not understand? These are not the French. These, this, is not, this is not, you know, Britain. This is Vietnam. He had no conception of who these people were in, in North Vietnam or in South Vietnam who he was relying on uh, or, and or negotiating with. He, 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 so it was, he, he was incapable of unlocking this puzzle that would and remember, when the puzzle gets unlocked, he still has to be somehow perceived as a president who did not lose a war. Right. So that puzzle becomes no easier after announcing he's not running. I, Fred, I, I how this, do you see it? I, I agree. Uh, I do have this sense that he still hoped, I don't know whether you agree, Lawrence, but I think he still hoped to be drafted in the yes. end for the... Oh, for yeah, the yes, so that, we have to yeah. remember that yeah. this yeah. conditions... Yeah. It certainly conditions his approach to the war. I think what I find interesting about the negotiations in 68 is the degree to which Lyndon Johnson drives a very, very hard bargain. Mm -hmm. um, I think he, when it's clear he's not going to be the nominee, there's a part of him that prefers Richard Nixon mm -hmm. uh, over Hubert Humphrey because he believes, I think legitimately, that Richard Nixon is more likely to prosecute the war in a forceful way than, than, Hubert, uh, than Hubert Humphrey will. Uh, and so I think Johnson, as I think you're suggesting, I think he struggles with this. We should also bear in mind, notwithstanding, as Ellen pointed out, the vow in his March 31st speech to reduce the bombing. The bombing, in fact, increases right. in the final months of 1969, both below the 19th parallel in North Vietnam and in Laos. And it had always gone on in South Vietnam. And it always comes. We, we, we tend Four to, times more bombs. Yeah, we exactly. focus on rolling thunder, which is a, which is a mistake. But, yeah. but I mean, don't... Yeah, I mean, sense? I think the other... To answer the original question about sort of what happens to the sort of the, the police part, the, the peace party, it has to be said, right? I, I think you'd agree. Um, McCarthy was a terrible candidate. <laughs> or at least not willing to, uh, to engage the people he needed to get... The nomination. I mean, he wouldn't pick up the phone and talk to Dick Daly. Aloof, the he would, aloof yes. <laughs> and or, or once he lost, he wouldn't rally his troops to vote for Humphrey, which might have made a difference in the outcome uh, of of the war. I mean, it, I don't think it would have ended the war, you know, uh, in a month or even a year, but it might have ended the war a, a, a couple of years earlier. I mean. It's, it's an open question. Another one that is counterfactuals, but you know, because he did have Samuel Huntington as one of his major advisors on the war, not exactly a dove. <laughs> I have this idea that, that uh, Michael Cohen, Boston Globe columnist and, and also an author of a book on 60, he suggested this, but I, I wonder what people think about this. If Robert Kennedy survives, he actually strengthens Humphrey's position ultimately, both in terms of the uh, of, the, of the Democratic Party, but also in the general election. Because a surviving Kennedy, um, Johnson and his people would not have wanted as the nominee. This is, this is Michael's theory. So he, he permits Humphrey more freedom of maneuver to come out against in opposition to the war at an earlier point. And it strengthens Humphrey in terms of the, 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 the ultimate race against Nixon in the fall, because as we know, Humphrey's closing the gap in those final weeks. Once he comes out in opposition to the war, however belatedly. Fine, yeah. I think it's, I'm somewhat dubious about that, but that's another detour we won't go to right now. But one thing I do think is important, we haven't talked about so far, 
is what else is going on in the country in this period. And in particular, Martin Luther King is involved in the Poor People's Campaign. There's increasing attention on the de facto segregation that exists in our society and the, the plight of African Americans, minorities in our cities, and uh, the reality of poverty. And uh, King himself, his interest in uh, the Poor People's Campaign and his opposition to the war in Vietnam converge in 68. And uh, Robert Kennedy, the perception of Robert Kennedy as somebody who could bridge these various divides in the Democratic Party does raise the question of whether uh, Kennedy uh, could have somehow healed these fractures that remain in some sense uh, to this day uh, and perhaps have staved off the peeling away of um, white ethnic working class uh, voters from the Democratic Party, which is, a, is underway in this period as well. So, uh, but let me throw Nixon into the mix here. Uh, it's about time. <laughs> he's important. Uh, Nixon, as we know, had a plan to end the war. Uh, it turned <laughs> out that it was going to be delayed by several years while he widened the war geographically. But uh, how does Nixon, in your view, emerge as a moderate in this context and manage really to uh, to reinvent himself, uh, and what war role did the war itself play in his ability to do that? Uh, Chris, do you want to comment on that? Yeah, well, he had one great advantage. He, had pre uh, he was preceded by two Democratic administrations. <laughs> so all he had to say is they had the opportunity and they screwed it up. So I'm going to come, you know, it's time for a change, and right. I've gotta, I'm going to bring peace with honor, a phrase that, you know, uh, Johnson has already sort of developed. Uh, and that's all he had to say and did say. And, uh, you know, meanwhile, behind the scenes, as Lawrence points out in his book and other people have now uh, talked about, he was going behind the scenes to try to, you know, make clear to the president of South Vietnam that if, uh, if, they, if he remained, uh, mm -hmm. you know, dead set against uh, any participation in the uh, it's halting but ongoing, you know, beginning of peace talks in, in Paris, that he'd get a better deal under Nixon. So. He was, paying, he was playing a hawkish game behind the scenes and a moderate one uh, publicly. And even further behind the scenes, I would say that Richard Nixon and Henry Kissinger, his national security advisor, when the doors were closed, my sense is that they were as pessimistic as anybody else that an, a, a, an independent, non-communist yeah, South could Vietnam be preserved, could yeah. be preserved yeah. over the long term. And so you have to ask yourself, even though, as Ellen points out, in some eyes, he's a kind of a moderate in all of this. How can you continue the war for another four years, even allowing for the fact that they're in a difficult position when they come in with half a million American ground troops on the, on the scene in South Vietnam, if that's what you believe in your heart of hearts when the doors are closed. Because they're not moralists, they're politicians. Mm -hmm. And uh, they, Johnson continued the war, and Nixon continued the war because they could not bear what the perception of them would be politically if they didn't. It, it, it is, I mean, to, that's the most economical way I could say it. And that's in domestic terms you're describing. Yes. Really. It's they, not about it, geopolitics. It, no, right. It's yeah. not about the world. It's about what is the right wing going to say? Uh, you know, what, is, what are the Republicans going to say about Johnson? Uh, what, you know, what's going to, what, what will they say about Nixon? And that, and that thing that neither one of them could ever figure out is uh, how, do I, how do I avoid being the first president right. to lose a war? They, they couldn't figure yes, it out. Yes. Briefly, you know, one of the more famous of the Pentagon pa papers that were released by Ellsberg was a 1966 document by an Assistant Secretary of Defense, John McNaughton, who said, never mind why we got into this war, you know, whether it was containment or the domino theory, that's meaningless. We're, we're staying in Vietnam for one reason and one reason only, and that is to avoid humiliation. Yeah. It's about national image, reputation, credibility. That particular one, it's more about the geopolitics in that particular sense. It's America's humiliation. But I think Lawrence is right in suggesting, and I think you also agree, that for the presidents, 
It's not so much about America's national yeah, reputation. Right, it's personal credibility. It's personal, personal credibility. Yeah. It's to some extent the partisan credibility, much less so than national. Can we talk just for a minute about your question, which you then, you, uh, <laughs> which, is, which is about Robert Kennedy, because I'm curious to know what the two of you, yeah. or the three of you, think about this. Well, I think, I, 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 I just, I mean, in a sense, I think, I think Humphrey always had the inside track. So I'm not sure that 68 was Kennedy's year. But I think about 72. Robert Kennedy would have been 46 him. years old. Yeah. He would have been 46 years old in the 72 well, campaign. That's what Sorensen's trying to tell him. Yeah. He wouldn't have had Johnson's shadow, or he wouldn't have to think about LBJ and his calculations. So I think my own answer to your question is that, yes, a surviving Robert Kennedy could have performed that very large function that you set for him but it's really four years later. I well, I think, I, well, my scenario does have Bobby running in 1972, but running for re-election. Uh, because you, the thing that has been lost uh, about Humphrey is it, it was that there was a worse, the worst candidate of 1968. It's a tie kind of between George Romney, who flames out before they even count a vote. So he's kind of the cartoonishly bad candidate. Humphrey was the absolute worst candidate anybody saw. Uh, when he came out of the gate and he made his announcement, it was the most horrible speech given so far in the campaign by anyone. It was flat. It was deadly. The pros all started to panic right away. Uh, they thought, you know, Hubert doesn't have it. Uh, and so, uh, and by this time, of course, uh, you know, uh, Bobby Kennedy is only weeks away from being killed, but, but, uh, but Humphrey's start of his campaign was atrocious. It was terrible. And people like Richard Daley, by the time you're getting to the convention in Chicago, are making phone calls, talking to Stephen Smith. Stephen Smith's making phone calls to Teddy and yeah, Hyannis yeah. saying, uh, Daly is very interested in you you getting, getting in here because they saw Hubert Humphrey as a terrible, terrible candidate. And so when, Humphrey was absolutely going to get in after Johnson got out. Uh, he got a slow start getting in because the assassination of Martin Luther King ate up several weeks of decent interval that Humphrey had to live through before he could announce. Uh, but. Uh, the, the idea that you could go into Chicago uh, it, it, with, uh, with Bobby Kennedy as a possibility against Hubert Humphrey, given what we saw in all of the platform fl fights and, and all of the strength that was actually surprisingly emerging uh, on the anti-war side within the convention apparatus, I think Bobby Kennedy would have ended up being the, the, both the compromise candidate and, most importantly, the guy who can win. There wasn't a person there who believed Hubert Humphrey could win the presidency. It was just, well, Gene McCarthy certainly can't. That's out of the question. And let's just go with the guy we know. And you know, there's a lot of, lot of personal dislike of Gene McCarthy that was just really made it utterly impossible. And McCarthy had none of the kind of guts and professional apparatus you need to go into a convention and take a nomination. So that was never going to happen. But I think Bobby Kennedy could have gone in there. I think he could have taken that nomination away uh, from Hubert Humphrey. And remember, Humphrey loses to Nixon. Humphrey, terrible candidate, who at a certain point has $100,000. That's his entire campaign treasury uh, in the fall. Uh, uh, they, they had no money. Uh, Humphrey running this horrible campaign. Nixon beats him by less than 1% of the vote. Less than 1% of the vote. If Bobby Kennedy is on that ticket against Richard Nixon, uh, that goes the other way, I think. The, uh, the Humphrey campaign, when you think about his slogan of the politics of joy after two assassinations, the midst of a <laughs> horrific war with and tremendous casualties. He got this reaction. He got laughed at. <laughs> he really did. It was not the way to go. Yeah. Uh, there is one we're going to turn to your questions in a moment, but I wanted to raise uh, the issue of George Wallace, who there is a farther right position here that makes Nixon appear to be a moderate in the midst of all of this. 
Uh, and the backlash already underway against the uh, anti, the more extreme elements of the anti-war movement, the Black Yippies, power. the um, the uh, events at the Democratic Convention in Chicago, uh, I think also uh, presumably uh, is a variable in moving Nixon into a position that uh, we might not have seen him as occupying without that far right uh, rising uh, threat uh, mm -hmm. that will, you know, gain traction over time as well. Yeah, the, George Wallace's uh, campaign manager told me during the Trump campaign uh, that, <laughs> that when he listened to Donald Trump, he was listening to George Wallace, that it was just all the same. And they actually did use a lot of the same language. And they both, uh, George Wallace and Trump, shared uh, this same um, uh, style and reaction to w the, the eruption of hecklers in their audience. Uh, if a heckler started yelling at George Wallace, uh, as many did when he was up at Dartmouth uh, giving a speech, uh, he loved it. He absolutely loved it. And he would yell back at them and call them communists and pinkos and uh, talk about, you know, yell something at them about their sandals and their ponytails and their beards and all this stuff. Uh, and you cut to 2016 and Donald Trump is up there saying, I want to punch him in the mouth as they're dragging the heckler, you know, out of his, uh, out of his hall. Uh, it was all stylistically Wallace, 1968. That's that's what you were seeing in the the Trump rallies. Well, there's a rich and dishonorable history to be told in all of this. But uh, it's time for us to turn to your questions. Uh, I think there are microphones on either side of the room. Uh, please approach uh, if you want to direct your question to one of the the uh, guests, uh, please say so. And I'd ask you to restrict your question to a question, please. It's a tremendous temptation, as all of us know, when you get before a microphone to start talking incessantly. But if you could really just ask a question and not give a speech, uh, we'd all be very grateful. So, sir, go ahead. I'm sorry, I have to just give one statement, okay. uh, if I may, before one I ask statement, the question. One statement, there's been a long history related with the Vietnam War about the issue of how veterans were treated. Some of it's mythological, some of it's true. My question is, to what extent do you as historians believe the attempt to undo those past wrongs to veterans has affected the quality of history that people understand really what happened? in Vietnam? It's a very interesting question. Chris, I want you to take, take. Uh, thank you for your question. Chris yeah, is I, the man to answer it. Very important question. Um, let's see if I can give it a short answer. It seems to me that one of the successful efforts to, in public memory since the Reagan years, to forget the most poisonous and toxic memories of the Vietnam War was to do two things. One, to demonize the memory of the anti-war movement. And two, to resurrect a respect, a reverence, a kind of reflexive uh, uh, um, uh, honor to all who serve in uniform as a category uh, to regard them as automatic heroes. And more than heroes, a kind of hero victims, going back to this point, that, this, that they have been mistreated and that we have to make up for that. And we, we've seen that in spades since 9-11, uh, I think. And um, while I have no trouble honoring national service, you know, I, I think we need to honor those, and there are many of you in the audience, who stood up against in the most vibrant and diverse anti-war movement in our history, stood up against the war in Vietnam. So I honor you. But we don't, we don't have a peace memorial. We don't have a peace highway. We don't have a peace holiday. And even uh, Martin Luther King, who does have a national holiday, he's not remembered for his extraordinary anti-war speeches. I mean, just, uh, and then I'll shut up, but the one incredible moment in a speech he gave exactly a year before he was murdered, he said, you know, I can't in good conscience go into black ghettos and tell young teenage boys not to pick up arms uh, 
uh, as long as I'm not also denouncing the greatest purveyor of violence in the world today, my own government. And that, that just has gotten erased uh, from, from memory. So I do agree with your premise that, um, that, that um, a lot of memory has been brushed under the carpet or sanitized about the war. That needs to be recovered. And recovering a, a more, a, 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 a broader memory, a more respectful memory of the anti-war movement is a place to start. Let's go over here. Yes. Uh, yes. Uh, I'd like to speak on behalf of the free press. Without that, you folks wouldn't be here tonight. Uh, and we know Trump is doing his best to say the press is the enemy of the people. Uh, there was a huge secret kept in August and September of uh, 1968 when Nixon was negotiating behind the scenes with the South Vietnamese government. Please don't start negotiations with the North. It'll help Humphrey get elected. Too bad the press wasn't able to release that in 1968. Nixon never would have been elected. And in 2016, when Trump was the, his campaign was the uh, object of a criminal investigation by the Justice Department, he kept going after Hillary being under investigation. The press never knew that Trump was a subject of a criminal investigation in 2016. Had we known that, Hillary would be president today. So my question is, Lawrence, do you know much in your book about Nixon's almost treasonous behavior really getting the war extended so he could get himself elected? Yeah, that's uh, covered in detail. And so the press didn't know about it. Uh, at all. So there was no option for the press to have reported on it. But Lyndon Johnson discovered it. The CIA brought it to him. The FBI uh, went to work on it. Johnson ordered more wiretaps uh, and more surveillance on the people involved in it. And so Johnson really knew exactly what was going on. And Johnson himself called it treason. Uh, he called it treason in phone calls that were taped at the time uh, that, uh, th that captured what he was trying to do. So Johnson was really stuck because this is you know, late October uh, when he's uh, discovering this and putting the pieces together. And, and Nixon, uh, at a certain point, knows that Johnson knows. Uh, Johnson uh, communicates with a, re a Republican senator in the hope that that senator will tell Nixon, Johnson knows what you're doing, you better stop what you're doing. Uh, but I think Nixon understood something about the predicament Johnson was in that no one else did. Uh, and so what it came down to it, Johnson threatened uh, the possibility, when he was talking to the Republican senator, of going public with this, of letting the New York Times know what Nixon was up to, letting the Washington Post know what Nixon was up to. And he thought about it very seriously. And in the end, and I think Nixon knew, having lived in the White House himself, that this would be the White House wise man advice on this. Um, the, the advice that Nixon got uh, was you cannot possibly go public with this. Uh, first of all, you don't want to reveal how we know this. You don't want to reveal how much surveillance we have on our embassies. You don't want to reveal sources and methods, okay. But uh, the other reason you can't go public with it is it, people won't necessarily believe it. It might look like just a Democrat's political ploy to try to hurt the Republican presidential candidate. Uh, and so, so, uh, so Johnson had these weighty presidential issues. And these, this is a, it, what I love about it is it's a genuine presidential decision. It's a, it's a decision that only, you only have to make in that job. Uh, that decision of do I let this become public or do I keep it uh, secret? And you know the, the CIA methods, all that stuff is serious stuff to consider when, when you're in the White House, when you're in that chair. And so Johnson ultimately did not allow it to become public. Uh, and Nixon, you know, squeaked through uh, to a victory. But um, that's all laid out, uh, you know, step by step in my book. And a really important book on this uh, is the great John Aloysius Farrell, who used to work in the Boston Globe right mm -hmm. over there, who has written the definitive uh, biography of Richard Nixon. And it was Jack Farrell who discovered Bob Haldeman's handwritten notes, uh, which are basically scenes of you know, Nixon standing here telling Haldeman what to communicate uh, to the South Vietnamese, and there's Haldeman's handwriting of, you know, uh, telling them, you know, Nixon saying, how do we throw a monkey wrench into this thing, and th the possibility of uh, peace talks uh, developing toward the end of the campaign. Uh, so that's all really important, and it is our, our first 
known and uh, only known case of collusion with a foreign power to elect a president, in this case, a Republican president. It is, however, just technically, uh, you can use this in a fit of anger if you want to. Uh, you can use the word treason, but you will not be legally correct. Uh, the Supreme Court has held that it is technically impossible to commit treason without a declaration of war. Uh, you have to actually be aiding and abetting the declared enemy in the war declaration. That's why the last treason case in America was, of course, during World War II, because that's the last time we were operating under a declaration of war. Uh, so uh, treason's the word everybody throws around these days, but it's technically not. I just, Fred, affirm, want to I, 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 I just want to affirm the, the, the premise or the first point you made, sir, about the, the importance of the press. And it seems to me, especially in this day and age, but also if we focus on the Vietnam era, it seems to me it's an absolute golden age of American journalism. And I want to stress that the, the journalists who went to Vietnam, in most cases, went there believing in the mission, believing in the, in, the, in the stated purpose of America's involvement in Vietnam. Many of them, I think, also came back still believing that, that the preservation of an, of an independent South Vietnam was a worthy and legitimate goal of the United States. However, what they did, it seems to me, men and women, over a period of many years, was to investigate to find out what was actually happening both militarily and politically in South, particularly South Vietnam. And it's an extraordinary record that they left us. I taught a class this last semester in which uh, undergraduates had an option of, of writing a paper on uh, David Halberstam or, and, or, or Neil Sheehan, both of them Harvard graduates. Um, and to, to listen to these students who then went in and investigated what those two particular journalists, but there are many of them, both print and television, it was just a revelation for these students. Um, and so I guess in a, in, a, in a funny way, I just want to affirm your point about the importance of, of what those journalists did then and why we need them now. Good. Uh, I'll, I'll We've got quite a few people that want to ask questions. So as much as I would like quick, short questions, we'll move to quick, short answers as much as we can. <laughs> Go ahead. Uh, there's two names that you haven't mentioned, uh, any of you, uh, Robert McNamara and uh, General Westmoreland. Uh, I was in during the Vietnam War, and both of them should have been court-martialed and shot, as far as I'm concerned. But I'd like your opinions, please. Court-martialed or shot, that's your choice. Pick one. Can you do both? <laughs> yeah, I have nothing positive to say about uh, either of them. Though, uh, you know, f I was reading something, was it you writing, that was at least pointing out that yeah, unlike yeah. any other of these war managers, Kissinger especially comes to mind, Nixon, others, uh, he was the one that actually did express some regret. Now, it was hedged, and it wasn't a complete apology, and he said it was a failure of judgment, not morality, um, and a lack of information, you know, over, you know, denying the fact that the, he had plenty of access to contrary information in 1964 and 5 that he just automatically described as illegitimate. But, uh, yeah, I mean, this came 30 years, too little, too late. Uh, and um, the other thing to remember is that he had personally come to the conclusion by at least 65 I that earlier, earlier mm -hmm. Even that earlier. that the war was un militarily unwinnable, the and yet wasn't work, and the right. bombing wasn't working, and, yeah. and that he continued to advocate publicly uh, the, both the progress of the war and then and, and the, the needed escalation. But what I do say in that in that piece that Chris is referencing is that he agonized over this. Yeah. And even that is all too rare in terms of our yeah. public officials. That, th th on that precise point, I think this is uh, evidence in favor of your position, Fred, on the Kennedy counterfactual. It is hard to imagine JFK having that evidence presented behind the scenes over and over again, and already seeing it himself in that CBS interview he did with Walter Cronkite. Uh, expressing doubts about it, that he would have error. continued. He would never admit error. And he did yeah. agonize over the deaths, but he did. And, and one huge difference between yeah. JFK and LBJ is that people were not afraid 
to tell JFK something JFK Correct. did not already right. think. Yeah. Right. And that was the big problem. People became afraid of telling Lyndon Johnson the things that he clearly did not want to hear about Vietnam. Having a president with the self-confidence to uh, be able to not only absorb but to invite criticism makes a difference. Yes. Uh, I'm going to go here and then we'll get two over here. Well, this is a great follow-up. Uh, I'm a combat veteran. I was wounded seriously. I was in Shelton Naval Hospital for a, a long time in the summer of 67. But I was here in 2003, and they had all the big wigs. Wes Marlin was here, Kissinger, and, and he was in Larry's seat. And Kissinger got up and said that uh, he was afraid to lose face. The administration didn't want to lose face. And I hear the same theme tonight, that no one wanted to lose face, Johnson, the other politicians, yet 20,000 American soldiers died because they didn't want to lose face. And I find it unconscionable yeah. that, that we send people to war and, and it, so they don't lose face. We're still doing it now. You know, I, I, I went to Boston State and I became an educator, and I, did, I listened to these people talk, and I listened to these shows, and I, it's, it's sickening. And uh, today I was at the PT, PTSD in Brockton Hospital, Brockton VA, and a g guy came out and walked, he was walking to his truck, really handsome young kid, no legs. And I turned to my friend and I said, what a sad thing. And I said, we're sending people to die, get maimed, and people don't want to lose face. I just don't get it. I really don't. And um, I just want to follow up what he said. I mean, how do you feel about that, Larry? You, you're, you, you have a lot of conscience. Well, how do you, you know, um, the, uh, <laughs> uh, the, the last man to die for the mistake, as John Kerry put it, was April 29th, 1975. We don't know what that date would have been if Gene McCarthy has not decided to run for president and put the Vietnam War on ballots in 1968. If the first anti-war candidate, which probably then would have been Bobby Kennedy, did not run until 1972, does that mean that that movement would have been able to force the end of that war some years later than it did? Uh, Nixon, uh, for the rest of his life, uh, Henry Kissinger still, complains, complains that Congress forced them to shut down this war. That is a complaint against democracy. Mm -hmm. That is a complaint against the elected representatives saying enough. And they did force the Nixon-Ford administration to shut down this war. They were changing their minds. Their kids were getting them to change their minds. Jean McCarthy's daughter, Mary McCarthy, who was a student uh, at Radcliffe at the time, was far more anti-war than Jean and against the war quicker in, than, than he was. The, 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 the people were moving in this direction because they were learning things that, that the Kissingers and the Robert McNamaras were refusing to admit, and people were changing their minds. And, and that, that Kissinger to this day sees as somehow undermining the presidency and undermining the presidency's attempt to prosecute uh, and, and the, the war in Vietnam and to have it, you know, have it, have its way in Vietnam. Uh, it, it, is, it, it is a fundamental misunderstanding on the part of Kissinger and the people who make that argument that, oh, you know, this would have turned out something differently if they had not been forced to end this thing. And in fact, as I think uh, Chris, you point out that what this ultimately gives way to is uh, the Dick Cheney criticism of the Vietnam syndrome. That is the reluctance because of this war to commit American military might, which is seen as a negative. Right. Like we shouldn't be too thoughtful about yeah. this. Uh, and too mindful of the history. How about over here? Yeah. I'm a combat Marine, fired my rifle at the enemy, and I'm an educator for 36 years, and to arm teachers is the dumbest thing I've ever heard in my life. Okay. Over here. 
Um, my name is Joe Cavadas. I, uh, I'm a veteran for peace, and I want to thank all the peaceniks who protested against the war because I didn't stay my full tour in Vietnam. I got out early, so I'm a, a, a person that I really love you people who helped me. Now, uh, 68, we forgot about the My Lai Massacre. That happened. And it happened all over Vietnam throughout the whole war. Uh, another thing is, I went with a group of uh, Vietnam veterans. We went to Ka Kazakhstan in 1988, and we met the Soviet soldiers who fought in Afghanistan. They were telling us the exact same story we were telling them. Didn't know where the enemy was, what was going on. The war was a, a debacle. And then I said, we'll never go to Afghanistan. Now, I look back at 68. We had uh, Joan Baez. We had uh, uh, the Sloan Coffin. We had these people. F uh, Politicians were in for, for, for peace. Now, we don't hear anything about peace at all. It's not even mentioned. I'm out in the street five, four days a week giving out flyers against one of Afghanistan. A lot of people say they volunteered for it. Uh, they just walk by not even mentioning it. And I look around and I said, there's no peace movement left. I have no idea why, because today is the 15th anniversary of the war in Iraq today, and we've been 17 years in Afghanistan. No story? How, how many stories do we hear about Afghanistan? And no tax. Your children are going to have to pay for this because it's a credit card war. Is that not true? So my, we had one last thing. All right. 300,000 head injuries. 300,000 head injuries. We all worry about Gronk, how his head injury is. <laughs> then we have uh, 22 suicides a day of veterans, 22 suicides of any group, that would be looked upon as a disaster in the okay. health care. What's going on? I, I mean, it. what happened to America? Thank you very much. Maybe okay, so. <laughs> Maybe just hear some more comments or more questions. The, I think the question yeah. really is why, uh, why we don't, where is the peace movement today? What happened? Well, I mean, I'll quickly say I think we have a lot of anti war opinion. The polls indicate that, but we don't have a broad anti-war movement or culture, and that's a real difference to the 1960s. Part of it is the lack of a draft. I heard people shouting that, but that's only a part of it. I think there has, unfortunately, developed as well a level of public cynicism about the ability of ordinary people to have any effect on what seems like a permanent war machine that's impervious to any yep. criticism and has a kind of life of its own. Um, uh, and, uh, yeah, so there are other factors. But I mean, I think to, that's, yeah. I just didn't want to say what echo what Chris has said. I think that's profoundly important, the cynicism. And cynicism, it seems to me, you know, if we were, if Americans were somewhat naive at the beginning of the Vietnam War, uh, to put it a little too simplistically, at the end of the Vietnam War, uh, people are too cynical. I mean, that's one of the important uh, results of the war. And it seems to me that cynicism is corrosive. Cynicism undermines our belief in democracy. I'm just repeating what Chris has said. And it occurs to me that in the Vietnam era, we see the completion of the Interstate Highway Act. It's an extraordinary thing. In the Vietnam era, we see the construction of thousands of public schools, universities. We see the great society, the legislation here that politicians from both parties uh, helped bring about. And the sad thing for me in 2018 is that it's very hard for me, at least at this political moment, this certain, this current moment, to imagine that happening, and I think it's a, a result of this cynicism. We've also seen the sanitizing of war, so that the war is a, a smart bomb being dropped down a smokestack yeah, on your so, television yeah. at night, yeah. rather than what we saw, those of us who lived through the Vietnam War, every single night in the footage that uh, Americans were exposed to relentlessly that brought the war to their home, into their living rooms. Uh, so let's go to this gentleman here. Good evening. My name is Avi, and so uh, my question uh, concerns the fact that regrettably um, the Vietnam War was largely fought by um, blue collar working class people. Um, the Vietnam War wasn't really shared. I mean, the sacrifice of those fighting in the Vietnam War wasn't equally shared by all socioeconomic classes. And so I'm wondering if uh, the three of you would be willing to comment on that. And also, um, would the outcome uh, be any different in, in your view if the, um, if the children of the elites 
as well as the children of the working class families um, had uh, equal numbers in, in terms of share of sacrifice and whatnot in the war. Chris? Chris, Chris is the expert this. on this. Chris wrote a marvelous book called Working Class War, which speaks to this. <laughs> well, you know, I agree that if the children of uh, Congress people and corporate presidents were as vulnerable to the draft as uh, working class kids in Dorchester, uh, th there might have been a, uh, a, an even more intense anti-war opposition sooner that could have made a real difference. Um, now, with the all-volunteer force, uh, there still is a class inequality in the military, and there is, there is something, there's some real truth to this idea of economic conscription. Uh, that is to say, they're not being formally conscripted, but economic circumstances and economic uh, inducements, bonuses, college, and so forth, are drawing people in for that reason uh, above all others for, in many cases. Um, so that, that inequality in our society, and not just in the military, is as pervasive as ever. Uh, and, you know, part of having a more democratic foreign policy is everyone having a skin in the game. Now, I'm, I have not yet accepted uh, or endorsed a draft, though the, I'm, I'm, I'm much more on the fence about that than I was before. Uh, my only holdout is, and unless and until Congress takes its constitutional responsibility to, um, on matters of war and peace, uh, I don't want to make my five sons vulnerable to a draft where an imperial president can continue to make war and peace decisions, you know, without public accountability. So. Uh, I'll just say, uh, as a footnote, in 1968 and, and during the Vietnam War, there were a lot more elites serving in combat, so-called elites, than there are now. Uh, President Johnson had son-in-law in Vietnam. Uh, uh, John Kerry, uh, you know, w went from Yale to Vietnam, uh, volunteered. Uh, you don't see that now. And, and members, many members of Congress had sons. Uh, in Vietnam uh, at the time. Many senators had sons in Vietnam at the time. Uh, you don't see that at all now. That has disappeared. And because you could in 68, as at least one person did, uh, get a note from your doctor about bone spurs and get out of the drought. A lot of people were getting those notes in 65 and 66 and 67 and 68. And so the, under, the, the understanding became clear that this is unfair. That's why they switched to a lottery. That's why under President Nixon it was switched to a lottery, and then there was really no real protection about it. If your number came up, you were going, and it didn't matter uh, what family you came from. And I saw that happen all the time when it switched to the lottery. The other thing that happened uh, in switching to the lottery is that you intensified a certain kind of opposition from people who thought they were going to escape this. But you then, when you gave my brother Billy this high number, he relaxed. He just kind of sat back and went, okay, I have a high number. I'm not threatened anymore. And I think I ended up with my lower number going to a few more peace demonstrations than he did. And so <laughs> the, you know, so that, and then Nixon actually ended the draft uh, completely uh, before the war ended. Uh, so all of that was perceived at the time and, and dealt with gradually. There's time for one more question. We'll take it over here. Thank you. Um, I'm a Vietnam era vet. I uh, worked for Bobby Kennedy, uh, cam presidential campaign in New York in, in 68 when he was killed. Um, what, since then, read a fair amount about, about the theories that uh, JFK might have been killed, um, possibly CIA, possibly other kind of things, for reasons of his potential opposition to the war. I, I know it's not certain. You discussed it a little bit. But I'm wondering to what degree in your book, Lawrence, for example, do, do you cover the, the possibility that Bobby Kennedy had that same suspicion about, about um, his brother being killed you know, by nefarious forces in the government? Well, on November 22nd, 1963, the first thing that Bobby Kennedy did was throw himself into fits of suspicion about everyone. And the CIA was one area of suspicion. and he summoned the director of the CIA to his home to say to him, you know, wh what happened here? Uh, and the CIA director had to swear a Catholic oath to him that he, the CIA had absolutely nothing to do with it. 
But Bobby kept thinking for a few hours about all the different angles, including organized crime, every single angle, actually, just about every angle that you've heard of in various conspiracy theories went through his mind uh, on that first afternoon. Uh, he eventually, uh, by, the, by the next day, uh, had actually completely given up this, this area of thought. He just stopped. He just realized, uh, there's nothing I'm going to be able to do with this. Uh, it, I, I'm not going to solve this. And for his own sanity, I think, also. Uh, he just pulled out of it completely. And then, and then the opposite happened. You couldn't get him interested in it. You actually couldn't get him interested in what the Warren Commission was doing. He didn't even want to bother to talk to them. But he also had, he also went through a period in which he was in deep despair. Uh, for many, many months after the assassination. And I think, and I don't think I'm the only one who thinks, that that was in part, I think, because he felt a certain amount of guilt. He wondered, at least, Bobby did, whether his very hawkish position on Cuba, for example, yeah. his determination to get Castro, had that somehow created, you know, whether it's Oswald alone um, or whether it's some sort of conspiracy. I think he struggled with that for many, Absolutely. many months yeah, uh, after, after the he was. That's part of what he was thinking that day. What did I do? Who, who did I animate? Who, who is, who's getting revenge based on something I did either as attorney general or in other roles? And there was an endless amount of, of possibilities for him to think Can about. Can I just make one quick comment? Since we've talked about a number of sort of what if questions, while well, they're fascinating and we get asked them all the time. As I always tell my students, it's hard enough just to figure out history as it actually happened. <laughs> Never mind that what no, might have happened if three or four different variables. But the counterfactuals are... help us better understand. What well, you know. well, mm -hmm. I they think could that potentially the at their best. <laughs> Historical okay. utility. All right. I think uh, <laughs> what I would like to say on that point is that uh, there remains a great deal yet to be learned about Robert Kennedy. And I look forward to the, all of his papers being opened um, and to historians to continue to work and to tap that vein to better understand the Kennedy presidency as a whole uh, and the remarkable story uh, that is uh, really uh, memorialized and uh, and uh, really kept alive here at the Kennedy Library. So I want to thank all of you for coming, for your questions, and to the library for inviting us for this discussion. Thank you.